Everyone, welcome to our first breakout session for uh, SOSG's Climate Tech Summit. We want to start with someone who uh, I'm particularly fond of the work that he does. Uh, so with us, we have Campus Jacobson from uh, Pale Blue Dot, general partner, uh, doing some incredible work. I'm gonna try to pronounce it Malmö. How was that? Yeah, you did it, that was well done. Fantastic, okay. I've been practicing. Um, Great. So everyone, thank you for joining. What we're going to do is we won't be having folks join us on the stage. Uh, this will just be his stage to uh, give you some great information, tell you more about the resources available at Pale Blue Dot. Um, but if you want to ask questions, and we encourage all questions, you will go into the session side. You'll see on your right side the chat box. Click session. That is the chat for this session. In the chat, you can put where you're from, write some cool notes, let us know what you're up to. But the Q&A little tab, that's where you're gonna ask your questions, okay? And that way Hampus can answer those, okay? That's the easiest way for everyone to see it. Uh, and fantastic, uh, I will leave it to you and I'll I'll jump back on in 29 minutes. Great. Hey everybody. Um, so I actually plan to do this fairly interactive, even if it's very strange to have an interactive when I'm the only person speaking and you're on chat. But I think that that's, I guess, the, the way the world works when you have 300 people in an audience. Um, but I'll, my plan was to tell you a bit about Pilbadot, a bit about how I thought about joining uh, like the climate change movement and how I thought about this and kind of the way we're designing Pilbadot and thinking about it. And I would love to actually get quite a lot of questions. So I would love if people's like, I have Questions higher or low, and I'm just going to look at the chat feed, and I'm just going to try to filter out questions and just try to answer people and hope that it works. And uh, otherwise, like I'm going to be super open with my email address and just like make sure that you can have a conversation. Um, so if we just start from the basics, I think that I'm a like it's not a controversial topic to say 2023, but I think that climate change is real. I think it's created by humanity. I also think that it's a very hard problem to solve because we have like a very slow moving world. Um, and not because people are bad or anything. It's just like um, cement, for example, 8% of emissions or steel, roughly 8% of emissions or anything. It's not something we just turn off and stop using. It's something that we have to shift to. And there are construction projects started today that, or that were started three years ago and that will be started in three years. There's food that we're eating now that were created before, blah, 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 blah. So like, it's hard to change. It takes a lot of time. So I think that my view on this is, and I'm going to try to like explain a bit like how I view our role and how I think we can all ask what we're doing in, in climate. Um, so if I go back to what I think the fundamental climate problem is, apart from the very fundamental basics of uh, emissions and global warming and tri tipping points and stuff, I think one of the headaches is that we have a lot of stuff that are negative on, to climate, obviously, and to temperatures and things. And I think that way I look at solutions, and this is like a thing that we at Table Dot really believe at, at heart, is that there are essentially three circles, a Venn diagram with three different circles of solutions. You have solutions that are behavioral solutions. That is like, for example, what if we all stopped eating meat? Like we just say, hey, I mean, there are plenty of people on the planet that survive without meat. If we stop it, that actually would be really good for climate. Uh, or what if we don't fly or, or whatever way of thinking about this. And then I think that uh, the other bubble here is the kind of technological bubble. So the technological bubble is very much like we can innovate ourselves out of this, we can create clean meat or whatever we wanna do. Like we can always like find tech that solves these problems. And then the third bubble are the, like is like the incentive way of looking at this, which is where, where policy comes in and everything like this. And I think one of the fundamental problems I find with the kind of the climate solution world is that people tend to be very tribalist about these hats. So people come into it very much like, uh, and if we like, you know, if I now just oversimplify and symbolize this, you have like the green camp of like the Greta Thunbergs who say, stop flying, stop eating, stop doing this. You have the, um, like the innovation bubble people who are like the Bill Gates who are like, we just like, you know, build fusion reactors and clean meat and we'll just deploy them and we don't need to change anything we do. And then you have the incentive people who essentially always point to like, either they say, we need new policy, we just need to change everything, we need to just scrap this, like make it illegal to make fossil fuel or increase the carbon taxes, or they say, we need crypto to come in and rewire the whole society. And for me, these are like the, the green, blue, and the red bubbles, a way of thinking about it. And I think one of the problems I find is that people very much come into this with their tribal hat, and they don't really realize that some of these solutions are actually much better taken care of of someone else that it's like, uh, this is actually not a technology problem, it's more of an incentive problem, and so on and so forth. So 
that's like one of the fundamental views I get into this when I think about the problem and really when we look at stuff at Pillbo Dot, certain problems we look at and certain companies we look at, we look at and ask, okay, so these people are really building an amazing like tech platform, that's really great. But the problem of this is, for example, if you look at food commodities, food commodities is a heavily subsidized world. Um, if you look at different markets, like, you know, look at anything from corn to beef, it is something where the governments usually subsidize it. And that they usually do it for job security, for domestic security reasons, and like other reasons, uh, and not necessarily for, for climate reasons. And that means that if somebody wants to innovate around food and commodities, like making a new crop or helping farmers or agriculturalists, one of the headaches is that they're actually up against massive incentives and taxes and policies that are essentially designed for another reason. So one of the headaches, if, if, if you now create a new amazing like chickpea based beef and you said everybody should eat this, and that's behavioral change. The problem is like you're up against both behavior, which is one kind of problem of tackling, but you're actually also very much up against incentives and policies. So this is like a very strange like world when I think that people really need to go into this and really realize where can they move and where can they, what, what levers do they have? So that's one framework we talk about a lot and discuss when we look at solutions. The second framework we talk a lot about is actually the role of venture at all. So I, I am part of running a venture fund. We're $200 million funds that invest in super crazy early stage climates. We do all the way from two people in a shed that are like in a direction and they just got started and they're really, really keen on looking at something, but they don't have that much, all the way to people who have half a million dollar revenue and they're, they have the customers and everything. So we really like what's usually called in the venture world, like pre-seed and seed stage. We're very often the first institutional in. We really enjoy being the first people to work with a company. And the reason we like that is really because we enjoy working with founders. I would say we're probably better, um, like better at helping founders than we're allocators. And I don't know that from a returns perspective. I just mean that what we enjoy doing day by day, it's much more fun to us to talk to founders than to LPs. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for like the fundraising we've, we've had, but it's like at the end of the day, how we spend our days. But so getting back to what our role is, not only Pelvo Dot, but what is actually the, the role of venture whatsoever. Because if we look at the climate crisis, the climate crisis in my world has three distinct pillars of issues. You have an inequality problem, which is massive. And it's very easy to look at like global north, global south and say, aha, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We know that Guyana is natural carbon sink, but like the way that oil is handled and it's actually really bad and the people of Guyana never meant this. But it's not only global north, global south. You have a lot of communities on the global north that actually are hit the hardest of climate change because they don't have the, the wealth, the education, the skin color and other reasons that they're not put in that bracket where they're now the ones that have to pay the cost of it, either that they have to pay their conditioning or the waste management or whatever it is because of who they are. So like there's a huge inequality problem, like whatever, how we recognize that. And if you have an issue with your own nation's policy, you can just think about it as global north, global south. If you want to stare at somebody, stare at another country and say that US has messed up or some other country has messed up, whatever. But like, think about the fact that there is a massive inequality problem. The second problem is we have an infrastructure problem. And the infrastructure problem is like, if we think about whenever, you know, PwC or Ernst Young or whatever says, it's like a hundred trillion bazillion dollars that we are now deploying into climate to change the world. The majority of that money is actually infrastructural money. And so infrastructure is like, if we think about it, we need to go from a fossil fuel based grid uh, to a clean grid, whatever, however that is, we need to transport these electrons to our households. And then we need to make sure that we have trucks and lorries and buses and vans that transport stuff around. And we need like roads that can handle this, maybe charge them real time, maybe something else, maybe total charge. Only the things I said right now, only like energy generation, transportation of electrons and transportation of atoms, like basic goods. If we think about the amount of money that has to go in to repave every road and rewire every line, it's an absurd amount of money. It's like just an absurd amount of money. And I think that when people talk about green jobs, a very large amount of green jobs are not going to be in startups or, or anything like fancy. It's actually just going to be like install heat pumps at people's homes or make sure that we can run green electricity or maintain wind farms or something. And the good thing about that, there are plenty of great jobs and plenty of, plenty of great opportunities to kind of become a great kind of climate worker. Um, but I think we also have to recognize that this is an area where it's very, very, very hard for venture funds to handle. And I'm like happy to go into kind of 
um, you know, what a venture fund is and how it works out. But if you think about it very, very, very simply, uh, infrastructure money is something where it's a great way of putting money, huge amount of one minute work and get interest rate level uh, returns for infinity. Um, because like, you know, if you build a bridge or build a power plant, whatever, like you're essentially like people will pay for the service forever uh, or as long as it lasts, right? The headache with it is that venture funds are exactly the opposite. Venture funds are the third bubble and the third bubble is innovation. So inequality, infrastructure, innovation. Innovation essentially is that we need to figure out a way, whether that is cancer or whether that is climate, we need to figure out a way to bet on stuff and to try things that we haven't tried before and think outside the box and be like contrarian or whatever you want to call it. Most people don't want this. Most people hate this. Like if you ask most people to just walk to work without a sweater, they would never do it. They would just think it's the worst day of their life. If like in certain parts of the world, if people would have to admit their, their sexuality or if people have to like stand up at work and have a speech, they would hate it, right? So like most people are not trying to kind of stand out. Most people are really happy about being accepted and normal and live that world. And there, the problem is that innovation is very, very hard to do because you have to kind of break rules. You have to say, I don't think this is the way we should generate electricity, or I don't think an apple falls to earth because God wants so, or whatever. Like you have to think outside the box and you have to kind of be a, quite, a bit of a, a different person thinking about it. That is really where venture is good. Venture is amazing at backing people who have crazy ideas that they would try. And if it works, it changes the world. That is actually something that venture is good at and has been good at for a long time. Whether that is backing Facebook to stare on teenage girls that then becomes a platform to talk in democracy and now is a middle-aged platform for selling goods, that is going to completely change the world. Like we all like today, we all have one or another interface with the social media and they just didn't exist 20 years ago. Same with mobile phones or anything else. These things have completely rewired the world. So venture is amazing at that. And the interesting thing there is like for me at least is venture is very good at doing stuff that no one else is trying to do because that's the only way you can make like huge returns. Like what's in investment world called alpha. Beta, beta is like when you're investing on the curve and you're essentially taking the advantage of the fact that you know, whatever EV chargers are coming or there's like a, something that everybody believes and then you just join the curve and you get part of it. Alpha is like when the thing you're investing is actually something that no one else is thinking about and you can actually get a huge, a huge advantage of that. And the interesting thing here is that that is actually what venture has historically been great at. The very good thing here is that not only do we need this for climate, but the good thing we need because like we need new solutions, but the other thing we really need is we need additionality. If every single person on the planet, if every single fund and every single employee is working on, for example, clean meat, that is not a great idea because clean meat, like meat is part of the problem, but whether we need to think about anything from forestry to transportation to energy generation and la, 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 la. So it's really good that people are thinking about different stuff. And what venture is really good at is thinking about stuff that people aren't thinking about. So if you look at Pale Blue Dot, if you look at our everyday, Heidi, Ewell, and myself, the three GPs, we're all having these conversations about like, how can you build urban mining? Urban mining being the term for like, how do you take stuff in the city or in the city environment and like scrap it and find valuable metals, metals or minerals or something that you can repurpose. And that is something that people didn't do before because there was no value in it. And now because of circularity and climate reasons, they're huge value. So we love talking about stuff that people don't talk about. And I think that's really good. But if I'm just gonna zoom out of that thing, I wanna highlight that venture is not great at handling inequality. Sadly, we haven't really figured out great instruments for the planet, it seems like. Infrastructure, venture is really not that great at infrastructure either because mo most venture funds don't have that kind of money. Like a big venture fund has like a billion dollars and a billion dollars is nothing if you're building something. Like if you're building a nuclear reactor, a billion dollars like won't take you that far. Venture is really amazing at innovation. So we're constantly discussing what are the things that like we handle well? What are the things that we as a venture fund plays well at? So like when somebody comes to us, why are you not putting more money into bridges or why are you not putting more money into local rice farmers uh, in a country? We say like the problem is like that is not innovation. That is like that. We can't handle really this. So then within innovation, we zoom in and we see these three bubbles of um, behavioral change problems, technology change problems and, and policy and, and like incentive change problems. And then we zoom into that and ask ourselves. So that's kind of the way our world and our everyday looks like. I'm really hoping that you're going to get me come with a couple of questions because I'm going to talk about the philosophy of this fund forever, but I'm not sure that it's something that most people are interested in. But 
last question or last thing I'm going to say before hoping that there's a lot of questions is how I got into this is I started thinking about how can I personally uh, for, for the person I am and not like rewiring myself completely and changing everything, how can I be a part of the climate change uh, solution? So that was the way I came into this. And I've been like caring and thinking about climate change for a long time. But if you roll back 10 years ago, it was very hard to think about how, well, I found it very hard to think about how I can do anything for climate change. Because I really felt, oh my God, like I'm not a chemist, I can't build batteries. I'm not a physicist, so I won't build nuclear reactors. Um, I can't build new trucks. So like, I guess I'm kind of worthless. Um, and I realized in my journeys and trying to figure out what I can do is I think that you have to go back and thinking about what your own skills are. If you're aged over 25 or maybe 30, it's hard to rewire yourself completely. And if you're a lawyer, you realize suddenly there's a massive amount of climate litigation. If you're an engineer, you can, you can work for a company. And I think that, or start a company. I think the thing I'm thinking about constantly is that you can vote with your votes your actual like you know democratic votes if you want you can vote with your dollars like you can buy goods that you're climate friendly and like doing things like that you can vote with what you work with so like you can actually completely change um like you know where you work you can decide to work at a company that does the best uh, or start a company for that sake and then you can actually also you can actually start voting with stuff like your pension money and other choices. So I think about this, and, this, and then last part, sorry, the fifth one is that you can actually vote your feet, you can protest. So I think about a lot, like when I was going into this, I was really thinking, where am I good? Am I good as a protester? Can I rally a lot of people? Can I move my pension money? Can I do this and that? And I realized that I happen to have done investments for 10 plus years, 100 plus, like 150 plus investments all over the US and Europe. And I realized that I, I started thinking that that's actually the, the kind of the unique advantage I have and like how I can make my everyday meaningful. And then I started thinking, because I've started a lot of companies before, I was starting thinking, am I best, am I best contributor here at starting a company or am I best here actually at investing companies? And like, I actually, because I started companies, I really enjoyed it and scaled them. And I also invest in a lot of companies. And I think that what I started realizing is that I started building this two by two matrix and in this matrix, I started thinking about the difference between driving the problem or enabling it. And I started thinking about having a, like depth versus breadth. So you get like four quadrants. So you get driving, enabling, depth, breadth. And now you have these four. So I'll give you an example of these. So if you're founder of a startup, you're driving depth. Or if you're PhD of a new thing, you're drive depth. What I mean by that is like you actually are the per. It stops with you. Like if you say that you're not going to do this, you're not going to do this. If you say you want blue, it's going to be blue. That's that's like the, the driving part. The depth part is like you know what you're talking about, and people have a hard time challenging you if you're right. If you go to the breadth part, the people who are in the breadth part are people who have more FOMO. They're more afraid of missing out on stuff, and they're okay being being told you don't know what you're doing. So the depth people say, "I've never wanted a room where somebody says you know what you're doing." The, 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 the breadth people say, I don't want to ever be in a situation where somebody talks about something. It's like, I have no idea what you're like, I don't know the topic. I feel shitty. I'm fine with being bad at the topic, but like, I, but I want to like, I want to know about the topic. And then if you go driving versus enabling, the driving people are the people who say the buck stops with me. I'm the person who decides enabling people who want to like get many shots on goal and get a lot of things to try. And I think that's the thing I think a lot of people should try to think about where they are in this two by two and ask, we ask themselves, would I prefer to help other people build climate stuff and be the expert for them to advise them, which means I'm a depth enable person. So I'm a person that tells people an advice and they are the ones that decide if they want to go with it. So you're a consultant and somebody says, I don't want to go with it and you're fine. You just say, okay, I like, it's okay. I'll skip it. Or you're a person uh, like that says, I want to drive it and do it with my own. Or you say, like you just think about where you're in this matrix. Sorry, I realize there are a lot of questions now, so I'm going to move into this. But I think it's like, for me at least, it's very important to start to think about what your role is and then thinking about your unique leverage in that, but then also thinking about if you prefer to enable others, so you're able to drive yourself and so on. Now I'm going to read the questions. You can upload these questions here to the right if you want me to prioritize differently. So, um, I'm going to start with Madison's question because she asked the question. So how does Pelvedot differentiate uh, true innovative ideas from companies that are just iterating another idea? I think this is a really great question. And I think this is kind of what I meant by um, additionality and contrarianism uh, or whatever you want to call the silly visa term. But the point here is like for us, like if we invest in the 15th 
ride sharing company or the 15 whatever company um it's like first of all it adds very little additionality like it, it's like climate wise i mean like you don't need one more of these but the other problem is like for us is if we're investing in the 12th version of airbnb like it has to have the idea that it's going to beat the, all the other airbnbs and acquire them or something and that's a very very hard bet because either we bet that the idea of airbnb is a bad idea and then this company also will not succeed or we'll have to bet that this company is so much better than everyone else and then it comes down to madison's question which is like how is this company innovative so we have a we have a full-time researcher we have plenty of people that we ask for dd when we look at an idea and we ask ourselves like you know is this truly innovative and then we actually ask ourselves quite a lot of questions about is this one of those companies where it's the it's the tech that makes it unique or is it like the hustling and the operations makes it unique because there are certain companies where if you make a fusion reactor, you need to get a certain number. And if you get a certain number, you actually have a gold mine. But there are other companies where you don't really have like a, like a such mo so much of a moment. It's more like a lot of moving parts. And if you get the moving parts right, like you're going to make money every time you do it, then you can scale. So that's like a thing. I, I don't know if I answered your question, Madison, but, I, but at least I tried. Uh, these are not really, or how do I, oh, sorry. Now I realize I can order them popular. Sorry, now I'd like, now I'm getting technology, technologically upgraded here as well. So Smari, I'm really sorry for the pronunciation if I'm not doing it correctly. Uh, you ask, uh, CO2 is a, is a great metric for the scale of the problem, but it's a terrible metric for the quality of the solution. Hyperfocus it on it distracts from visification. Exactly. So like, I'm not going to read this the question, but, or is there a question? There is actually a question mark. Um, what is your take on the current type of focus on, on CO2? So the thing is like, I couldn't have asked, added better as Mari. Uh, the thing is like, so we've invested in, so far it's two biodiversity companies. We're looking at a water company right now quite deeply. Um, and I think that um, uh, we have done a region ag company, uh, maybe two actually, <laughs> realizing it. Sorry, that's like the weird thing when you invested in, like we invest in one company per month. So like I realized that there's more happened since I thought about it. Um, so I 100% agree with you. I think the way I think about this is that if you think about, just take biodiversity versus carbon, which is fairly simple to think about when you start thinking about it. Um, carbon is a non-sovereign atom and it's a fungible. And now I'm using a lot of like modern worlds, words, but these words are true because car a carbon atom doesn't matter if it's above Mongolia, in Mongolia or it's above Utah. Like it doesn't really matter at all. Like it contributes to the same global warming issue. Um, so it's a non-sovereign gas in the fact that we don't care where it is. And it's fungible because one carbon atom is one carbon atom. So if somebody takes out, quote unquote, that carbon atom across Utah, like we have one less carbon atom. If we take biodiversity, biodiversity is much more like a supply chain of, of an organization. If you're building a car and you're, you don't have enough rubber, you cannot do the car. You just can't make the tires anymore. Uh, and it doesn't matter because like you can't replace the car, the tires, the rubber with a chassis. You can't just say, we'll take something else. So if we lose the bats or whatever, we can't just replace them with donkeys. If we lose a butterfly, we can't replace it with a mosquito. We can just say, ah, it's kind of the same. They're non-fungible. And they're non-sovereign as well, because like you might have a lot of something in Australia, but then you don't have a lot of something in Italy. And that means that the Italian environment really changes. And that creates a lot of issues like mudslide or desertification or something. And it doesn't create it for, for Australia, because maybe they have that environment, but it still happens in Italy. And this is a huge problem that I think that we're not tackling with really well. And I think the problem, I think that you're saying really well, Smari, is I think that the problem we're doing right now is we're trying to project everything down to a very simple metric. So carbon is like GDP, where we just say, okay, how well are we doing? Can you just tell me the number? And I think biodiversity is more like happiness or whatever, where we have like countries that are trying to measure happiness. And it's hard, which means that a lot of countries, as you say, and organizations such as Smari, they just ignore the complicated metric like uh, biodiversity. And they just say, let's look at the carbon. So I 100% agree with you, you. And I think that it's really about looking at both standard standards. And like, for example, UK has come up with a great biodiversity standard for, for construction, which means that all new construction in the UK has to be biodiversity positive. I think there's a massive regulation coming up in Scandinavia next year, which is really revamping how biodiversity looks like. And then you also have investing. You have companies that are building really interesting biodiversity MRV, measurement reporting verification solutions, quantifying it. And then also what I find very fascinating, there are companies that actually look at what is the value of biodiversity for a company supply chain. If you look at like L'Oreal or another cosmetics company, they're very, very, very high need 
of high biodiversity to be able to create their product. If they run out of a certain flower, they, they can't get the stamens of that flower. Without the stamens of the flower, they can't create that fragrance. They're toast. They have to find a new product. So that actually is really interesting because suddenly it comes down to capitalism. It actually comes down to if biodiversity goes lower, you're toast. And before I go to the next question, I think it's really important that people understand biodiversity is actually really vital for climate change for another reason. So I'll give an example. Uh, you have once watched a movie with sharks and your kids said, I wish somebody could kill all the sharks. And you were sitting there thinking, yeah, why aren't we not killing all the sharks? The thing is, if we kill all the sharks, sharks are actually a fairly, like they're a top predator. So one of their like jobs is actually to kind of control the ecosystem. And that ecosystem actually goes all the way down to the coral reefs. And the coral reefs, if the coral reefs um, are messed up, they're actually part of what keeps the, the water to be able to take as much carbon. So if we kill all the, the, the sharks, we actually mess up the coral reefs, which means that the ocean can't have as much CO2 as possible. So actually there is a connection between some of these. So I think that like, we really need to be more intelligent about it. And thank you a lot for asking questions, Mark. I'm gonna go into the next question now. Sam, there are clearly massive gaps in early stage of financing for climate and nature startup tied largely to much diluting funding between backbone patient capital, expecting lower risk with hockey returns. Do an investor philanthropist, da, da, da. how can the Czech writing community reconcile the critical problem of holding backbone solution from scaling? I actually think, I'm not really sure I agree with you, Sam. I think that of course there are many solutions we want online and we want like get up in there and running, but I would actually say there are many, many, many early stage funds right now that are really looking to find amazing ways of investing in climate. There is a big problem though I would agree with you, and that is that we need a lot of infrastructural solutions and venture just won't touch those. So we have a problem of like, how do we actually get venture capital, or no, sorry, how do we get capital to touch that second stack? And that actually gets into Lindsay's question, which is what do you think about debt financing options for climate startups looking at pre-seed seed funding options? Um, and I think it's a really good question because I think that when you look at certain solutions, first of a kind, financing is a huge problem. You have something that you think really works, but to actually get off the ground, you need 2 million euros or dollars or yen or something um, to actually, 2 million yen is a lot less, sorry. Um, so like you actually need uh, to kind of get this solution and test it. And then that's a problem we have. And I think that um, it, for me, it is a bit of a tricky problem where we have to figure it out both with grants. And I think we see it in the US now with, with like an acceleration on that stack. We see it in Europe coming up, but it's definitely a big lacking factor. And I think that there are many more solutions we should look into, which are ways that we can like lessen the burden of climate rollout problems. Um, and if you're saying like you're looking for debt financing for pre-seed and seed, I think that is sadly very, very early because the problem is the backer, the one who puts in the money now, they will take startup risk, which is like 60% of the companies will fail. And they look at infrastructural returns, which are like 5%. And that equation doesn't really work in a normal like capital environment. You need like, you know, lower risk or high return. And you don't want a situation where you're going to pay like 80% interest for that loan. So I think there's something there that we have to figure out. And I don't know what that is, uh, but it's not, there's really nothing great for like early stage debt. Do you work with companies that make hardware? Yes. Um, they have, they, I totally agree, it takes longer time, but I think that there are really good ways of mitigating it. I think one of the things that I think, it's one that takes longer time. I think one of the biggest problems with hardware is usually the, you have to convert science into engineering, engineering into product, and product into commercial. And that is like four steps and each can take a year each. And the problem is like, when you look at that from the outside as investor, if you're not into electrical vehicle infrastructure or something, you actually don't even know what good looks like. So you have no idea how you're gonna figure out if that company reached the next milestone. So I think it's, there are more hard investors coming online, which are really good. If you haven't talked to Third Sphere, for example, they're amazing, they have a strong thesis about hardware. I think that Extension, Europe are really good. Um, there are plenty more, and I'm blanking on the names because I'm trying to answer all the questions. In your experience, now I'm asking Adit's question. Uh, in your experience, how have climate startups successfully helped create business models in the behavioral category? That's a really great question. I think it's really good. I think that we see, for example, there are a couple of companies that are working with different kind of recycling, which I think is really interesting. And I think that one of the headaches here is like, I think that the interesting thing about behavior is that I, and I'm a very crass person, I think it's very hard to invest in an idea than when people are gonna do it for, with the good of their hearts. Like if you think that you'll enable people to be able to uh, buy carbon credits so they voluntarily can fly, I think that's very hard because a lot of people are going to be a bit, bit you know, cheap on when they're doing that and not looking at quality or, or paying a lot. Um, so I think for me, it's like really looking at what people are actually trying to do and actually figuring out a way that we can make that easier. So if you look at, for example, used sales, like a lot of people would be super happy to buy used products if they were just guaranteed the quality, the repairs, 
and they you know, essentially those are two, I guess. Um, so I think the question is, could we make a thing that makes it very easy for somebody to look at used products and then just make sure that they have maintenance of those products? Uh, because that actually just empowers like, existing behavior that is already there. It might be nascent. So like I usually quite a lot of times I try to figure out, is this a new behavior that we have to build from scratch? Or is this actually a behavior that is already there that we can just like empower into? Um, deep tech, same question there, Caleb. I think that I don't think it's a huge problem because now we have a very mature secondary market. I think that more of these things will like will work out. Um, I think they're not trivial. Uh, sorry, I jumped Stuart's question, but I think I kind of answered your question before when I talked about hardware. How does Pelbadot think about allocating capital in correspondence with climate solutions as outlined by PC net zero pathways opposed to Vogue? For example, outsized percent of dollars is going to carbon accounting ED platform. Yeah. So like this is like gets back to Madison's question is like we haven't invested in a single carbon accounting company. We have seen more than 150 ones of them. We don't even take meetings with them. We took meetings with the first, I think we took meetings with the first 50 we met back in 2019. And when we had met 20 of them, we said that to the 21st, before we took the meeting, you have to send something to explain to us why you're different from these vendors. And then we actually started building an ocean page and like a, you know, like Google Docs page kind of level where like whenever anybody said, oh, we have something different. We send them this page and said, we've talked to these people. If you think you're different than all of these, then please have an email. Otherwise, I'm not really sure that we're, I think we're just going to waste your time. So we don't. We actually think that the whole point, both to Stuart and Madison's question, is that if you do what's vogue, you will not create outsized returns. And that is the point of the venture fund. So I think that you actually, the person who is investing is actually playing the game the wrong way. Um, Conrad, I'm going to answer the question before Stefan interrupts me. Venture funding for B Corps, I think it works just fine. We have companies that are converting to B Corps. So we think it's a great idea. Now Stefan is going to say, I don't have, I have no chance to talk more. Or maybe he doesn't. You did answer those in just like incredible rapid fire. That was very well done. Or I try to go even faster. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Unless you spot like one you really, really want to answer in the next minute. Um, uh, I, guess I, I, saw, I saw Frank's question, which is the next one I voted here to just be democratic. How do you think about the hardware versus software uh, in your portfolio? So like if we look at a portfolio, we think about like a, we, we, we are not actually thinking about this in the way that we're thinking we want X percent of hardware, X percent of software. What we're looking at really is actually very much a portfolio approach. So we're really thinking about like we don't want too much in anything. So um, we have plotted out, like, for example, food, we've plotted up from like genetically created new crops all the way to restaurants. And we're just looking at like all the parts. And we as a pre-seed fund and early stage fund, we can't really do multiple bets in one of these categories until one of the companies either like is at their C round and they don't care about those or they're, they're, they're gone. So we've like plotted all these industries as a massive matrix. And we just look at them and say, we haven't done something in this category. For example, we're looking desperate at the water. We haven't done anything in water. We're thinking about all the time in water. But we've done we've done three hardware companies. We've done three that are like tech enabled that are moving lots of atoms. We've done syn synthetic biology. We've done like deep deep machine learning. We've done like all fintech. We do all kinds of stuff. But the question for us is always: Is this overlapping too much with an existing company? Well, that was great. Thank you so much for your time, Hampus. That was fantastic. Um, how should people reach you if they would like to reach out? Who should reach out to people? Um, if you can reach me, yeah, they, I think the easiest is like, yeah, talk about people it. can just email me actually. I think that, um, I think that I'm very, like people can pay me on this platform. I'm going to stay here for a bit and answer mm -hmm. questions. I think that I probably can write, where do I write here? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll ask, I'll just ask a question. Uh, my, oh, my email is, um, is so you can email me and i'll promise i'll try to respond to everybody i think that um i do respond to all the emails that are actually real emails um so here's my email address feel very very free to, to email me it's not a problem at all um also um my twitter is like usually where i'm very accessible so i think that feel very free to contact me and ping me on either medium um like you can dm me on twitter or you can just you know follow me away if i say something that you find is relevant or ask me there and you can just email me so i ask the questions here in the in like the q a field here sorry for that maybe being the wrong solution uh yeah, upload it nice, you see if you want to i will put it over in chat great fantastic well thank you everyone um Meet us in the next session. Have us have a great rest of your your week. Uh, I'll you know, we'll exchange some chats and uh, thank you a bunch. And uh, I'll I'll see you next time I'm over in Sweden. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. All right, take care, everyone. Bye.